Let's look at uh, Daniel, uh, ninth chapter, verse 27. We're looking after, we're looking for the 70th, 70th week. He will make a firm covenant, talking about the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with many for one week. That's, that's going to be the week of tribulation. That's a seven-year program. But in the middle of the week, that's three, three and a half years on the front side, then the middle and then the back side of three and a half Uh he, the Antichrist, will put a stop to sacrifice, grain offering, and on the wing of abomination, which in the New Testament they're going to call it the ab abomination of desolation, will come one who makes desolation even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is, uh, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolation. That's the second coming of Christ that will come and do the Antichrist in. Okay? So what we're talking about is this uh, one week out of Daniel, you know, out of the 70 weeks, he, he goes 7, 62, and 1, right, to get to the 70. And, and what he's actually talking about is years, and we've gone now. I, I forget what study this is, but we're, we're deep into Daniel right now. Uh, I don't even remember how many we've done. But um, that we're looking at this one week, and... Uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation, shows you three divine judgments. Now, here's what people miss sometimes. These are three divine judgments upon the world. Okay, not it's, they're not local. They're, they're universal. And that's, 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 you want to remember that because... Most, most of the natural catastrophes we see, like locally, Texas gets hit, and that's a big local thing. And then Florida gets hit, that's a big local. And even though there, it's, there's a lot of devastation in it, it's minute compared to what the tribulation is. When he throws down something, a natural catastrophe that comes in the tribulation will be like that worldwide. Okay? So that's a good thing to remember because we're going to talk about three divine judgments in that one seven-year period. And he says that the judgments that are going to come, there has never been anything like it ever. I mean, there's no way to even compare and so there's the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls over that seven-year seven period. And oh, I, um, I actually, there was a moment when I actually thought I could teach the three of them at one time. I could actually go through one hour. John Dyer looked at it and said, I don't think you should even try that. <laughs> and I think he might have been right. So, um, so I'm going to take them three three separate and take a good look at them, uh, even though the church won't be there. Now, I'm, I hear this. L let me have uh, my engine starting to race. So l let's pause and have a word of prayer. Uh, do we have a? I know we'll have a special prayer in a moment, uh, Glenda. Do we have a, a special prayer tonight? Just a special one that I can mention right now for Christian. Oh yeah. Well, that's well. It's going to be months. Well, at some point, they, we, we can talk. Let's pray. I give, I give you this moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit the privilege to confess sin if necessary. It is necessary if, 
if you understand the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living, which means spiritual means you've got to be indwelt by the Spirit. That's salvation. You've got to be filled with the Spirit. That's, that's Bible study. You can't study it carnal. Carnal would be the evidence of personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or avert sins. They need to be confessed before study so the Holy Spirit can teach you the truth of the Word of God. 1 John 1, 9 says, Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. This is a sanctification aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Puts you back into a position where the Holy Spirit can teach you because you're open to that now, to have him teach you the truth of the Word of God. It is truth exercised in your soul that sets you free from the cosmic system of lies. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way both by the automobile and Internet. We pray, Father, for those who are home <clears throat> listening in uh, with us tonight, <clears throat> that they would have uh, classroom etiquette. They need to concentrate and be quiet and be still and let the Holy Spirit teach them truth. <clears throat> They need to cut off cell phones and distractions and television, all those things, put themselves in a place where they can isolate themselves and hear the small voice as it's declared, which is the ministry of the Spirit in the believer's life, teaching them and bringing things to, to their memory that are important for them to exercise the word that's being taught. We pray for these things tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let me tell you how simple this thing is about the church doesn't go through. I hear this over the years, you know, people go like, well, I think the church is going to go through the tribulation, all this kind of stuff. Okay, I wrote it on your paper. It is important to understand the church will not go through tribulation. It will not go through the tribulation because Jesus would have to bring judgment upon himself as the church. He is the church, the Savior of the body and the head of it. There's no way he could do that and bring judgment. I mean, there's no way that can be. <clears throat> no way. So <clears throat> it's important. For example, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, <clears throat> and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. There's no way he's going to bring divine judgment, I mean, upon himself. I mean, that deal has already been done. Or 1 Corinthians 12, 27, you, <clears throat> referring to church age believers, are Christ's body, individual members of it. That's the reason. That's, that's the most simple, logical answer to that, in my opinion. There's no way that can happen. <clears throat> so, you know, so let's, let's understand the church will not go through the tribulation. When I talk about the seven seals, <clears throat> the seven trumpets and the seven bowls, we will not go through that. Okay. Why, why would he beat up the bride before he married her? Well, I know. Well, <clears throat> not as God. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just not, it, it doesn't make any sense. So <clears throat> today we'll study the first divine judgment of the tribulation. It's called the seven seals. <clears throat> and we will show how this judgment of seven seals will affect the world, okay? That's, that's the goal we're after. So let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're looking at the sixth chapter. The seven seals are going to go through chapter six up to eight, five, <clears throat> okay? So we're, gonna, we're just going to take a look at some of this stuff as we go through it. And what you're going to see, like most divine judgments, <clears throat> as they, the further they go on, the more intense they get, right? I mean, it's true in our life, too. When we get under divine discipline, he starts out light, and then he, then he, he, he so we the five cycles of divine discipline to the nation of Israel does the same thing. So there's a pattern here that we're, we ought to be familiar with. So when we get the seals, although they're going to be tough, <clears throat> They're going to be tough. Um, it, it, when the trumpets blow and then when the bowls come, I mean, it's going to be lights out. So, so I mean, this, 
we're, we're into that aspect of it. If you have a study Bible, <clears throat> um, you will see one of the most important things when you, when you open the sixth chapter up. Um, it says, and I, and I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, uh, as with a voice of thunder, come. That's a really important thing on the seals. So I want you to pay attention to that. The word come. And I looked and behold a white horse. Now that's not the white horse of Revelation now of 19. This is not the Lord. This is the Antichrist. <clears throat> the white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow uh, like a bow and arrow and a, a war weapon and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay. Um, then um, that if you if you um, go back to the fifth chapter verse 12 to find out who this lamb is of course you're you're aware that we're talking about the lamb of God <clears throat> but in verse 12 we're told who that lamb is that's going to open the seal in verse 12 worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor glory blessings uh, and of course, that is the the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, <clears throat> so he's going to and listen. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to open all seven seals. He's going to he's going to kick this thing off. He's going to open all seven seals. He's not going to do this again. <clears throat> this is, but he 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 kicks this thing off. He opens the first seal, the second seal, third seal, and so so forth. You, you'll see that. You'll see that he broke. He breaks the second seal in verse three. He breaks the 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 third seal in verse five, and so so on. If you have a study Bible, they probably broke all the seals down for you, right? <clears throat> if you have a study Bible, so the Lamb of God in in uh, chapter six, verse one uh, is, uh, uh, and often you will hear. Notice that the first four seals are horses. Right, we have the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. This, or what the Greeks call the sick horse, and um, you will hear people refer to the apocalypse four horsemen. This, this, the tribulation is often referred to as the the apocalypse tribulation. Mm -hmm. So, just so you would know, well, the white horse is the dictator of the revived Roman Empire known to most of us as the Antichrist. And, and um, he, he, he is identified as one who is, who is coming to, uh, in, in conquest, right? Conquest. <clears throat> um, remember that the seals are during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. I mention that because most people think of this as a time of peace. It really isn't, as we will see, but there's a lot of talk about it, kind of like in the Middle East. Every president that we have goes to the Middle East and talks about peace between Israel and Arabs, which means they don't, nobody's telling them the truth about the Word of God, are they? <clears throat> and so it's just a political thing. By now, you know they have, they have been told but they go, everybody goes through the exercise knowing that it's futile, don't they? I mean, everybody knows it. I mean, everybody, oh, well, here they go again. What's going to come out of this? Nothing. Everybody is going to talk peace and, and build arms. No, I mean, all three people, America, uh, Israel, and the Arab nations are all going to go talk peace and then build their armies. <laughs> uh, of course, we're smart enough to know this. Even if they declared it, it would be bogus, right? It wouldn't last an hour. Well, anyhow, um, I, want to, I, want you to, I want you to hold your place in Revelation. I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians with me because this is, this is a period of peace. It's a period of peace when the seven seals are going to be opened and much more. But things are really going to heat up in the middle of the trib. Uh, if I can ever find Thessalonians. Uh, 
else? <laughs> yeah, you got that right. Uh, first, I'm looking at the first, the ch book one, five, three. Book one, five, three. I should have typed this out. It would have been easier for all of us. But one, five, I keep going to the second chapter. Five, three. <clears throat> You've heard this preached probably, and this is the context for it. While they were saying peace and safety, <clears throat> then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pains upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. Right? In other words, everybody's going to talk in peace and safety during that three-year peace, and everybody's going to build their arms. Everybody. <clears throat> and uh, because somebody is in the know out there that the tribulational period is coming. And so, but anyhow, um, this, while this is a period where everybody's talking peace, it's certainly not. And God is going to drop the seals on them during this period. He's going to drop the seals on them. <clears throat> seals by judgments, not a whole bunch of animals. Okay? So 1 Thessalonians 5.3, that's a discussion about the, f f the, the attitude and w the media and all that that, all the news that's being produced out there is all about peace and safety when it's really about when everybody's building up to go to war. We've, the guy that's out there running this whole peace for safety program uh, is the dictator of the Rive Roman Empire who is really building an army because his purpose is to co conquer, is conquest. And uh, he, he'll be that guy. Um, Remember the words when he opens up in verse 6, 6-1, six, uh, the lamb breaks the seal, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice, come. Remember that. That's, that's going to be important. We're going to see it again. I put it on your paper. You're going to see it again in the fourth seal, the last horse. Well, the white horse, the white horse is out with the first seal. Uh, now it's, a, it's talking peace, but building an, a building for conquest. The second seal in verses 3 and 4, if you have a study Bible, breaks, breaks the second seal. I heard a second living creature say, come, right? Second seal. And another red horse, uh, or and another, a red horse went out to him who sat on it. It was granted to take peace from the earth and that men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Um, you'll see that he is now going to exercise that uh, through military strength. He's going to say there's only one way you can have peace, and that's through military strength, right? The way you can only have, and we do understand that as a nation. I mean, it's not, <clears throat> and, and of course, he's going to sell that principle uh, but listen, what he's going to do is he, he's actually building for war to take peace from the world, right? right. Uh, and he's, he, Satan's got his man in the, in the office it, full of charismatic gobbledygook. Uh, you know, I mean, he's going to be a world leader and everybody's going to go and then things are going to happen with his life. That everybody goes like, oh, he must be a god. Then he's going to go, yep. He stat puts his statue up, and then, then it's really going to go nuts. At the third seal, in verses 5 and 6, he broke the third, third seal. I heard the third living creature say, come, right? We've got it now. We're going to see that this rolls all the way through four, right? It's going to be come. Uh, and I looked. See, and what's happening? Now he tells you. See, when he said come, well, goes over there and takes a look. And, and there it is. He sees the vision. Then he then he, the, this opens the second seal and he says come. And he goes over and he takes a look and he sees a red horse. And he's told what, what it's about. Then third, come. Then the fourth, come. Right? And he's come to take a look. All right. He broke the third. I heard the third living creature say, come. And so I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. 
And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for denarius. That's, I mean, that's, that's one meal for a day's wages, basically. Three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm, and do not harm oil and wine. Okay? So what you're going to have during this period is you're going to have an economical, you're going to have an economical collapse and a famine. Economical collapse. And you know who's pushing this? God. That's the third seal of judgment. And and the key is there's a pale, you know, there's a, there's a scale, you know, a, an economical way to measure things, you know, Dow Jones or <laughs> whatever. It's what we're talking about. There's going to be an absolute economical collapse and famine. The fourth seal, seven and eight, then he broke the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth creature saying, come. So I, I went and looked. Behold, a sick horse, a pale horse, and he who sat on its name was Death and Hades. Death and Hades was following him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beast. Did you get that? A fourth of the what? A fourth of the world population. Listen, some of us go back far enough, oh, not to the year, but to when education actually was taught. And you might remember the Black Plague. It was called the, either the Black Plague, plague or, or the Black, or Black Death in the 14th century. It took a fourth, a fourth of Europe died, and maybe more, They're, they safely say 25%, uh, but they really believe it was probably closer to 50. Europe. They call it the number one killer of people in the world. Not geographically, I'm talking about as a group. And that's just Europe. Can you imagine if that's the worst and it just affected Europe, you know, just a handful of nations, what it will be like when a fourth of the world dies this way? And look how they'll die. <clears throat> a fourth of the earth. They will die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, and wild beast. Now you can, you can take that to the bank, buddy. That's that, that's that's that's, that's going to happen. A fourth of the earth. <clears throat> I thought I would go on the internet, take a look, and see if anybody had anything near anything other. I just was curious to say if, I, if my teachers were right about the Black Plague. And uh, certainly that was listed. <clears throat> and all the other ones are all local. You know, an earthquake here and a flood here and this and that. <clears throat> Do you know what they never mentioned in all of my exploration? I couldn't find it. Of course, I'm not a genius on the, on the Internet by any means. <clears throat> but there is one that will stand in comparison with this, what would that be? There is one that's going to stand in comparison to what the tribulation is going to bring about. Mm. Noah's Ark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the flood. Took them all out but eight. Yeah, nobody, nobody, but nobody mentions it. Do you know that record is more reliable as far as history? Is something that's been passed down historically 
than any other record they have on date, and nobody mentions that? That's amazing to me. You know why? Because it's found in the Bible. They don't mind talking about every other book in the whole wide world, but this is the one book that's been around the longest and quoted the most. They don't even mention it. How pitiful. No, pitiful. Well, anyhow. You know why that's important to us in this, this study? Because of Matthew 24, 37, which is not on your paper, I don't think. <clears throat> you know why that's important? Because listen to this. Prior to the second coming of Christ, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. You know why, that, you know why, why that's equivalent? So let's be sure we know that there's one bigger than the black plague and that it's equal with what's going to happen at the second coming of Christ. Right? I mean, the good book, the good book is going to tell us. The fifth seal. The fifth seal, the horses are done. They're all out in the pasture now. And the fifth seal is martyrdom. Look at nine, the fifth seal. Your Bible probably says martyrs, right? It's got to study Bible. And when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Watch this. Watch these two because. Slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony, which is the gospel, because of the testimony which they had maintained. They're talking about the, the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are, these are the martyrs of the word of God. Listen, you know why? Because, listen, these are the custodians, a divine agency in every, in every dispensation and in every, in every generation of every dispensation, there is a divine agency with a pivot of believers who stand the ground on behalf of God. The custodian of the word of God and evangelism. God has always had this group of people. And if you want to meet those people, read the genealogies of Jesus Christ, like in Matthew 1 or Luke 3. They give you the genealogy of these wonderful uh, pivot of believers who never wavered in their walk, in their obligation with God, their responsibility. And now it's our turn, people. It's our turn. We're going to carry this flag to this, this group of people. God is going to have that group of people. We carry the flag to them. <laughs> well, I hope we understand that response. Listen, the, listen, two things. The word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care where you go or how your life gets screwy, never vary, vary off from these two great important principles. That's who we are. Born again. And listen, it's not the majority that carry the flag from one generation to the next. It's always the pivot of people who do not waver you can't buy me. You cannot buy me. You cannot buy me. I tell you, a young pastor, that's one of the first things he's got to get in his soul that he cannot be bought. Because let me tell you, the church will buy you out of the word of God evangelism in a heartbeat. They will offer you money. They'll offer you a bigger church and a bigger this and a bigger that. And then when you get there, they won't let you do what God has called you to do. Never sell your soul out. If you're gonna, you sell it out to God because they're the only one that thinks it's worth anything. Everybody else thinks you ain't worth nothing. It's the only person in this whole wide world that knows the value of your soul to God. Well, because of the word of God and because of the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're under, they're under the altar and now they're going to be given a, each a white robe and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer, we're in the fifth seal, until the number of their fellow servants, martyrs, and their brethren who were to be killed 
even as they had been, should be completed also. That's the fifth seal. That's the fifth seal. In this, in, in, and so we're given, and they were told they should rest for a little while. Eh? Well, a little while apparently is, you know, three and a half more years, right? <laughs> That's a pretty good rest, isn't it? The sixth seal. In verses 12 through 17, we have the sixth seal. Look how interesting this deal is. Now, look how long it is. We're going from, you know, we, you know, seal one, we had a couple verses. Seal two, we had a couple verses. When we had horses out of the barn, uh, we had short. Now, they're out in pasture, and now we're getting long stuff going. So what, what's that tell you? Things are starting to heat up. See, things are starting to heat up. Well, I looked, and when he broke the sixth seal, isn't that interesting? Did you catch that? Every other time he broke the seal and said, come, right? This time, listen, they're anxious to look. I mean, they're looking before he breaks the seal. I love that. These are people, that, are we not interested in the word of God, people? I mean, there are a lot of things you could have done tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. I looked, and, he, and when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. Now watch, watch the sky. The sun became black. The whole moon became like blood. Stars of the sky fell to the earth like figs cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. Listen to this. Every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Every mountain and island on the earth. I mean, you think this hurricane that we just went through at Florida was something? Holy catfish. Wow. It is going to be so bad that the kings, listen, we're still in the first three and a half years. <laughs> this is that period of peace that they talk about. And God's revving it up. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders of the rich and the strong, every slave and free man. You know what that? Every social class there is on the face of the earth. Every social class on the face of the earth hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and to the rocks to fall on them and to hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne from the raft of the Lamb. Now, this sounds like a group of people ready for the gospel. Right? And they're going to get it. They, well, what, you've, I mean, are they primed? I mean... I mean, I want the lamb, but I don't want the raft, right? Yes, what you think? Wrong. Isn't that tragic? God, but listen, God's still going to send them the evangelist. You know what they're going to do with them? <laughs> this is what they've been doing. What did they do with the fifth seal? You know why God keeps sending, sending people? You know why he keeps sending people that love God, love his word, and love the gospel of Jesus Christ and the possibility that other people could be saved? You know why he keeps doing that? Because of 2 Peter 3, 9, God is long-suffering, not wishing that any perish, but all come to repentance. And you would think that these people are really primed for time, life, lifetime, right? He's going to send them a core of evangelists as has never been seen. And these people are not going to repent. Isn't 
Isn't that sad? You think that the lamb is not a big deal? You th in the angelic conflict, do you not think that Jesus Christ is the big deal? Anything. Listen, I'll get, here's the, the devil. I will give you anything but Jesus Christ. I'll give you anything. I will give you anything but not Jesus Christ. And listen, we live in a culture where they'll take it heads up every day over Jesus Christ. I was talking to a young couple the other day, living in sin up to their eyeballs. I said to them, what do you possibly think? What, write on the paper what you think good is going to come out of your relationship that you got going. Oh, they wrote me just glowing reports. I said, how is that possible when you're living, quote, in sin? Now, I mean, in sin. I mean, I'm not talking. I said, of course, nobody understands the laws of Alabama. I said, you know, you may not want, you may not want to think about marriage, but I'll tell you, you already are in the state of Alabama. Huh? Mm, don't believe it when you get legal. Don't, don't believe it when you get legal. Yeah. Wait till you go to court. There's, there's our mass. They think, they think that they can live in sin and good things are going to come out of it. How is that possible? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Good things will come out of sin. Oh, yes. I'm all over that. Well, good luck if you can find a church that does that. And they said, we have. How about that? They have found a church that goes along with that. Well, I said, won't be mine. I can tell you that right now. It won't be mine. How is it possible that good can come out of sin? How is that possible? You could even think that screwy. No, it's not. I mean, you talk about a, a train wreck. Well, anyhow, I don't know. The Lord keeps sending me people like this, and I don't know why. Just to, just to, no, just to irritate me. Huh? Oh, I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm not looking for answers from you. I just threw that out there. I'm not, I'm not looking for, I, I, look, I, I'm okay with this. I'm just vetting a little bit. They said to the mountains, to the rock, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him. Now watch this. Seven is an interlude. Your Bible says it. There's an interlude. See, we're not going to get to, listen to me now, this is important. We're not getting to, look, let me just show it to you. Chapter 8. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. We don't get to the seventh seal. Here's the seventh seal. And when he broke the seventh seal, okay? Chapter 7 is an interlude. There is a pause. There is a break. There is a pause between the sixth seal in chapter 6. And the seventh seal in chapter 8. Agreed? And if you have a study Bible, it's called the interlude. The pause. <laughs> the pause. Okay? The pause. There is a pause. And this pause should cause us some pause to study about that. Well, <clears throat> guess who's going to show up? Verse 4, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of sons of Israel. Our 144 evangelists have, have shown up and have gone through training. Isn't that interesting? Now, when you study the tribes, here's what you're going to miss. You say there's 12 tribes and there's 12,000 from every tribe, right? But, and there are 12 tribes and there's 12,000 from every tribe. But the tribes are different. 
these are not these are not the normal listing of the tribe. For example, the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. First time he's not ever discussed. The tribe of Dan is out. Also, the tribe of Ephraim out. Neither one of those two tribes are listed. If you go through that list, you won't find them. What you will find in their place is Manasseh, you know, Ephraim and Manasseh out of Joseph. Manasseh stays, Ephraim goes. Dan goes, but Joseph stays. Joseph is there. Now, Joseph was taken out, and the two sons were put in, right? Remember, we went through that whole deal? These are the 12 tribes. The 144,000, there's the, there's that. And you go like, whoa, 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 why would Dan and Ephraim be out? Because of their idolatrous practice as nations. That's why. The two, two, the two of them. Well, that interlude, and it gives a listing of all the people. And they cried out with a loud voice. Let's see, let's go, let's go to verse 9 because we got the 44. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches were in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Look at that verse 12. Verse 12, this is my verse because of my Sunday preaching. You know what this begins with? Amen. Amen. That's that truly, truly I say to you. Remember that? Now watch. There's an amen at the beginning, and there's an amen at the end. All right. Just wanted to show you that go, come to church on Sunday. Amen. Blessings. Watch the seven things. Watch seven things. Now, what are they doing? They're praising. All right. Amen. Okay? You know what that means? Here's what it means. It, and it shall be so. You know what the last amen means? So let it be so. We have an interlude. We're about to come to the seventh, the seventh seal, and buddy, it's going to break open. Okay, and we're going to go from the seven seals. We're going to go to the seven trumpets. We're going from the seven trumpets into the seven bowls. You understand the judgments? <laughs> Amen. Blessings. Watch the seven things. Blessings, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Boy, is that something? You want to know what? You want to know what, how you're going to how you're going to talk in heaven? Well, take a peek. And one of the elders answered and said, saying to me, "These who are clothed in white robes, who are they, and from where have they come?" I said to him, "My Lord, you know." And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made white in the blood of the lamb. These are the martyrs that were under the altar earlier in f five. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in the temple. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. They shall hunger. Watch this now. This shows you something. This shows you just how how excited God is that we would be faithful as stewards of his word and his, and his evangelism. They shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst. Them. Listen, these are the people who have been martyred because of the word of God and because of the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ unto death. They shall hunger no more, they neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them to springs of wa the water of life, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eye. That's, 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 pre -revela that's the pre-revelation 21-22 when he wipes away every tear from everybody's eye. Do you understand that? That's the same phrase, but it's, it's done early, isn't it? This is the prelude between the sixth seal and the seventh seal when the Lord does that. He does it to those who have been martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ. That is, guarding the word of God and the evangelism of grace gospel of salvation. 
I mean, this gives you the heart of God. It shows you how important this is to him in the history of human race. That's the interlude. Verse 8, seventh seal. And when he broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for half an hour of prayer. Now, it's very seldom you have any kind of our idea connected to heaven because you're in eternity. It's, you're into some timeless space, right? It's called eternal, not time space. When you have time space, it's something that's going on in heaven that's related to the earth. So I wonder what this, a half an hour, they pause in heaven for a half an hour of something important for the earth. They have a half an hour of prayer. I saw the seven angels who stood before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and such Incense was given to him that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed pits of thunder and sounds of flash of lightning and an earthquake. And we've got the seven angels now going to engage. Listen, here's what it says. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. And now we go in. The seventh seal announces the seven trumpet judgments. You understand that? Listen, where did that prayer take place? Where did it take place? Did it take place in heaven or on earth? It took place in heaven. On behalf of what? The earth. Can I tell you how important prayer is to God? Do you understand that? Do you, do you have any idea, then get it from this passage, how important your prayer time with God is? Because God's having prayer in heaven for the earth. He wants the earth to have prayer for heaven, right? Prayer is a big deal. You know, I hear people say, well, I don't know why you have to pray if, he, if, he, if God knows what he's going to do. <laughs> right? Because God wants it. That's why. God, God wants to have a conversation with you. You know how lonely it would be to live with somebody who never talked to you? You know how lonely that would be? They talk to anybody else. They talk to the dog. They talk to that dog a half a day. Or anybody who'd call, never talk to you. Can I tell you? Can I tell you? I know that's not prayer, but it's talking, isn't it? And how important that is to you. Just to have some kind of conversation. I know my wife, when I'd come home, and we had a house full of kids, she wanted adult time. I knew what she meant. I was tired when I got home of adult time. You know, all day long, I was struggling. I was slugging out with guys out there uh, in the business world. 
I was sick and tired of talking to adults, and I come home, and she's sick and tired of talking to kids. And so, listen, we finally understood a, a really good thing. I came home. I, I talked to the kids for a while. This really worked. I gave her a break. She went and got a good hot shower or whatever she had to do. I played with the kids and talked to the kids because I was sick and tired of talking to adults with problems all day long. And then we'd get the kids to bed, and then we'd actually sit down and have a wonderful conversation prayer and do all the things that adults ought to be doing. It was a wonderful thing. But when I walked through the door and she says, oh, my goodness, I'm glad you're home. I need some adult time. I thought, oh, I was hoping to come home and not have any adult time. Well, anyhow, the seventh seal, let me tell you, the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for a half an hour for prayer. so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints. Huh. Uh, who thought he was even keeping count up there? I mean, what's this adding? What's this adding? Let him add some of yours, okay, this week, since he adds them. Let's give him some. Let's, let's wear his pencil out. Let's give him some. That'd be good. That'd be good. And what the seventh seal does is announce the seven trumpets, which we'll talk about next week. Let me close. Boy, John was right. I hate it when John's right all the time. Remember that this occurs in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. We don't normally think of the first three and a half years that are known as peace to be like this. But imagine what the next, next two are going to be like. And listen, this is going to happen just as it's spoken. It's going to happen just as sure as overripe grapes fall to the ground. Isn't that what he said? A little wind. Listen, that gets the ones that are almost ripe, the wind. If there's no wind, they'll drop on their own, won't they? Once again, we are reminded, listen to me, and I'm going to close. Once again, we are reminded of the grace of God that is given us who live in the church age. We are reminded of the grace of God. How, how wonderful the grace of God is that's been given to us that we live in the church age. I don't know how I wrote it on your paper, but... I mean, listen, we don't go... On our worst day, we're not in the tribulation. As bad as... As bad as these, as, as bad as it hit, Texas got hit, and as bad as as if Florida got hit, and nothing. I mean, we live. Listen, I believe personally that we live in the. I believe we the church in the we live in the golden age. I think we we live in the golden age of the church age in America. I don't know that anybody's lived a better quality of life under the banner of, of God than the modern day church of America. We, you know, the, in history, they always talk about golden ages of different. We live, in my opinion, looking at history, looking at church history, you couldn't have picked. But you know what? God picked it for you. And, and when people complain about their life and how difficult things are and everything, it just, they just, listen. So remember that the next time you go through some trials and testings in your life, let's just remember how amazing God's grace has been to us. How amazing his grace is to allow us to live in a, in the golden age of the church in America. 
and then with grateful hearts, apply James 1, 2 through 4. You know what we should do every day of our life? I don't care what falls on your plate. Your plate's the best plate as ever anybody's ever had. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Who more? Who more than you and I? And listen, even then, when you're going through trials and tribulation, you count it all joy, and he tells you why. Because the exercise that God has given in your life to develop in you, if you read on in James 1. I mean, it's an amazing grace that you and I live, and we live in a most amazing time. And when something passes through your life, it falls on your plate. It's counted all joy because that truly is what it's about. It truly is about all joy. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your, your grace, and we thank you for these that have come our way to study with us today on the seals. Next week, we'll study the trumpets, and uh, things will get worse. They won't get better. And we thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. When, we're, when we are faithless, you are faithful. And I'll tell you, Father, we don't spend enough reflecting on your amazing grace in our daily living. We live in the golden age of the church. I do believe that. We have so much to be thankful for. We have so much responsibility. We are such privileged people. But in all of that, we are the custodians of the word of God and evangelism. And we need to be about that business. Not to be distracted. Not to set back because it's a golden age. But to be aggressive. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.